Hello, Malaysia, and welcome to the first edition of Medical Today right here on the Bernama News Channel. I'm Jared Rutnam, and of course, uh, with a medical show, it's always very exciting because there's a lot to learn with regards to what happens in the medical world. Now, all of us want to be doctors these days. We, we go Google something every time we get a headache. We Google something and we find out we have cancer now. Uh, it, it is becoming a big problem in Malaysia and also around the world. And uh, of course, in programs like this, we want to debunk myths. Uh, we also want to talk about what's fact and uh, what's not, and also give you lots of information. But before we get to all that and talk about our topic uh, this morning, uh, we're going to introduce two very distinguished guests joining us. We have Gregory Scott Brown, who's the group CEO of Ramsey, Saim Darby Healthcare. And we also have joining him, Sharifa Fauzia Said Mota, the Regulatory Affairs Director slash pharmacist of Pharma Niagara Burhat. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us on our pilot episode. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank well, you. Uh, it's all very exciting times for us with Malaysia Baru and uh, uh, things to come. Now, before we get into the thick of things, of course, what we want to do later on is talk about Dr. Google. I'm sure you're going to weigh in on this. And we've got a lot to say with regards to this. Greg, uh, you've been working in the industry for quite a while now. Uh, you've uh, been in Malaysia for close to a year. Uh, what's your uh, idea of uh, what's happening or your perception as to what's happening in Malaysia with regards to the medical fraternity? Thank you, Jaron, and good morning. Um, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, in the um, period that I've been in Malaysia, I've been very impressed with the quality of the healthcare mm -hmm. services in Malaysia. I've met a lot of doctors. Uh, we've got a number of um, high quality private hospitals. Our staff are wonderful, committed to, uh, to healthcare. Uh, and I really think that the opportunity for us is to uh, follow some of the leads from the other countries, particularly my experiences in Australia. And one of the great success stories was the collaboration between the public and the private sector. And I believe that's a real opportunity for us mm -hmm. going forward is to collaborate uh, a lot more closely in areas like medical training, uh, clinical research, clinical trials. And we're very well uh, supported by Cancer Research mm -hmm. Malaysia in, uh, in Ramsey Saim Darby. So that's an area that I want to expand on and, uh, and really develop a lot more for us. Right. Let's uh, move to Sharifa now, and I've got a tough, tough one for you. Okay. Just to begin the show, uh, it's like a baptism of fire <laughs> for you. Sharifa, wh what are the challenges uh, the pharmaceutical industry in Malaysia faces at this point? Okay, um, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, um, that's a very broad question. Okay. It is a very yes, broad it question. Is, it may take a couple question. of days. Huh? <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay, there are uh, many different stakeholders within the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, right from one end, you have the manufacturers or the makers of the uh, pharmaceutical products. And on the other hand, you have the uh, end users. Okay? So I think perhaps for today's discussion, we will focus on the challenges for the other, the other end, which is the end users, or the nation, uh, if I may say. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it from that perspective, the main challenge is ensuring accessibility of medicine. Okay. And when you talk about accessibility, there are two things that comes into place. One is availability. Somebody's got to make the medication available, right? So, and it, can, and it uh, must not just be available, it has to also meet the safety, quality, and um, uh, the, stand, the required standards. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the second aspect is affordability. Okay. If it's not affordable, then I'm afraid it is not accessible. Right. So, um, so accessibility is a key challenge for the which, nation. Which brings to mind a few other questions yes. like uh, taxes, for example. Yes. We've got the GST, now it's zero rated, now we're moving to SST. How is all this going to uh, play uh, or, or come inside and uh, 
disrupt what's happening within the okay, for the pharmaceutical yeah, world. For the pharmaceutical industry, for most of the drug products uh, that is being um, um, manufactured and sold at the end of the day, it's actually already zero rated. Mm -hmm. So um, I suppose uh, the other aspects of the healthcare, uh, the services, uh, we, it will be... Um, it, we, we will be able to see some changes, right. uh, some positive changes. Great, we're going to come back to you and talk about changes. So when, when she talks about other services within the health industry, which needs to be worked on immediately at this point, in terms of, let's say, collaboration yes. to begin with, uh, where do you think you see us starting? Well, I think we need to get feedback from our consumers and, and our doctors and, and our staff because they're the ones that experience it. Uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. We also need to talk to uh, the Ministry of Health and understand what their challenges are. And I think once we understand the challenges, then we can work collaboratively to, yeah. to address that. But I think medical training and, uh, and medical research is, is areas that we really need to work well together on. And preventative medicine is, is probably the biggest issue, which sounds a, a little bit mm -hmm. when we're talking about we're service providers, but we want to prevent people from potentially using our facilities, I think that's important. We, we really need to understand what's important. Right, so when you talk about preventive medicine or preventative medicine, uh, of course, I don't know if it's still within your area or your scope of work, but uh, how would you see it? Well, well, well what, what are you sensing with regards to that? How far are we from having good preventative medicine practice in this country? Um, there is a saying that says uh, prevention is better than cure, okay? I think what is needed is uh, to create a lot more awareness in terms of um, actually uh, pre uh, doing the prevention aspect. Um, I think Malaysians are very, um, you know, we, we love our food mm -hmm. very much. <laughs> and, and that is one aspect that, yes, despite the fact that we are food haven, but we really need to create awareness because at the end of the day, it's what you eat and whether you exercise or not, you know, that really um, is very important. It's in too much of a buzzword now, but yeah. lifestyle yeah. changes yes, are lifestyle. very important. Correct. And you know, I, I guess most of us in Asia want to look for that magical pill that yeah. will cure everything. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know whether this. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take okay. a short break, right. of course. And when we come back, we're going to find out more about uh, what's happening in the world of medicine or the medical world right here on Medical Today, BNC. Stay with us. Hello Malaysia and welcome back to the all new Medical Today right here on the Bernama News Channel, also known as BNC. I'm Jared Rutnam. And uh, like we said before, uh, there are a lot of things happening uh, on the internet with regards to people uh, trying to gain information about health and uh, trying to self-medicate, so to speak. Now, if you do a search, and we've got some information here, thanks to a great production team, medical and apparently health are the two words most spoken about, and in fact, is also the most Google words. Medical alone has, uh, listen to this, 616 million searches while uh, health has 16 billion searches. Now, that's about twice the world population. So everyone is uh, logged on to this or hooked on to this. Now, search engines like Google have long been playing Dr. Google for many of us. And uh, when a mysterious cough or rash or acne appears, we go to Google and we get information. But sometimes, information needs to be processed and it of course needs to be dispensed by a professional. Now we've got a little video for you uh, which is going to talk about what's happening online. Uh, we're going to play that video for you and come back and talk to our guests and get their feedback as to what they think about this whole issue. According to Google, 1 in 20 Google searches are health related. Meanwhile, the Australian Natural Health Online magazine says an increasing number of people are Googling for information before consulting a real-life doctor. The online magazine says that the benefits are enormous if you could tread cautiously and listen to the right people. However, it could put your health at considerable risk if you seek for the wrong information or sites. 
Uh, yes, I do check. Uh, normally, I, I normally every day I'm using Google lah. Uh, whatever, whatever is. Even we have the, the you know the Google Google teacher. Uh, there's a box that you you speak to the Google. Google will reply to you. Medicine, medicine. Normally, uh, you know some people ask me. Uh, you know I'm taking this one. If you don't know, then we type in the medicine name and then we get it. And then we try to explain whoever it is what is uh, side effect lah. Uh, what does it does? All this yeah. It's very good. The 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 Google uh, you know, sometimes they come back with the, the result is fantastic, very good, very good. Uh, to know what is the sickness about and to know uh, how the history and what it needs to be done, yes, I use Google to get the knowledge and know-how. But in terms of medication and all, uh, I think we are still orthodox, we still refer to the doctors to get our medication. People of all ages as well as non-professionals commonly upload information to various chat sites as a way to express themselves, offering advice on healthcare and wellness. They may not be necessarily wrong. However, former Australian Psychological Society President Bob Montgomery advises to clarify the qualifications and scientific background of the authors of the chat groups. E-health may be easy to access, cheap, quicker, more enjoyable than sitting in a waiting room, but will patients stop going to the GP? Uh, I don't know. For me, I would search from websites first and then go to professional. Uh, like the, what you said is the medical personnel to, to ask for their, their professional. Because you have to know what's happening and then you ask professional their opinions. This, I don't know, this is my problem. <laughs> yeah. For us, uh, logically, we will sure will approach to the, we will, we will visit the, the medical doctor first to see the, uh, to seek what, what's wrong with us. And then thereafter, um, we will probably will, will launch into internet for a second opinion to check or we may consult another uh, physicians to find out uh, whether what the first doctor say is true or not, uh, say it's for check and balance. Very interesting video there indeed, people weighing in on what they think about Dr. Google. Now let's talk to our, our guests in the studios. We've got Sharifa and Greg who's joining us. Well, uh, you've heard what people have to say, but from what I gather, people, are, uh, when they give out information, they're still kind of half and half with, you know, whether I should Google and go to a pharmacy. Because, see, the problem is, pharmacies now, um, you go there and say, I've got a cough and a sore throat, and they're giving you medication already. So we, we've got these problems to deal with. But you know, by looking at what we saw, uh, what are your thoughts, Sharifa? Well, basically, if you talk about getting medical information mm -hmm. from the search engines like Google, yeah, from my personal opinion, you can do it. Right. But you have to make sure it is from a reliable source. Guilty. Guilty. <laughs> okay. Now, but how do you know whether it's a reliable source yeah. or not? There's, there's a few things that you need to look into. Number one, assess the credibility of the content owner, right? Are they from a professional body? For example, WHO, yeah. for example, the Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. or Medline. Okay, these are reputable um, sites. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also come from individuals, but if they come from individuals, what is the credibility of that particular person? Mm -hmm. Does he or she have the experience to be writing about such topics? Right. And uh, interestingly right now, if you refer to our handphones, mm -hmm. we always get very nice videos, um, people telling us information about me medical conditions, right? right? But you do not know where the source comes from. So mm -hmm. that is very dangerous. Right. So firstly, you need to know, to, you need to ensure that it's from a reliable source. And secondly, after you've gotten the information, it stops there. Mm -hmm. Don't self-diagnose. Right. Don't self-medicate. You leave that to the professionals because yeah. they're trained to do it. You know, in, uh, before you can diagnose, like the physician, they're trained to look at the overall clinical condition of the patient. And that is something you cannot expect to read up and then just make a, make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's not for the, 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 the majority of us. Yeah, but I remember the good old days. Things have changed now. I remember the good old days when you have a hip pain. 
you walk into the pharmacy and say, hey, can I have a 10 days worth of ciclofloxacin? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have some NSAIDs to go. And, you know, but these things have changed. And yes. I think it's better controlled now. Yes. Uh, well, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you, Jared. I, I think uh, certainly in our business, we're committed to patient-centered care. So the more information patients can have and be involved in their treatment, the better the outcome. Uh, we believe they're going to be more compliant because they understand the impact of decisions that are either made by them or made by their specialists. So I think it's uh, the more information people but, can but have. But don't you think we've become, you know, with all this information available, yeah. most of us have become hypochondriacs, you know, because <laughs> there's so much of information available online. Like, yeah. like going back to what you said, yeah. no, verify the source, yeah. that's the most important <laughs> yeah. thing. So you're talking about two or three sources. Yeah. With regards to verifying the source yeah. or sources, yeah. what is your advice? I think you've got to be very careful and, and you've got to weigh up the advice and you've also got to listen to your body. I think we, we know what's happening with our, our body. So, and, but the more advice you can get, the more informed decision. And I, I think that's certainly my recommendation that we each need to make an informed decision on the, the advice that we're given going forward. So mm -hmm. the more, more information you can get, the better informed you are. Right. But don't you think that's kind of changed the, the way uh, the medical practice runs in a certain country. Remember the days when you used to walk into a GP and he, uh, he's the, uh, lo and behold, he's there to tell you whatever and you, you take that advice, yeah. you go home and do whatever's necessary. Yeah. Today, you, you get to ask questions, yes. you're informed. Yes. So how do we find that balance, Sharifa? Yeah. Um, interestingly, the video that was shown just now, mm -hmm. uh, someone said that you know he can, he can ask the doctor again or get a second opinion. I think that's very good because, um, yes, the medical professionals, they are, are trained, but it is also good that when you come in, you have some kind of knowledge. Right. But yeah. do not use that knowledge and self-diagnose for mm -hmm. yourself or your family member. Mm -hmm. I but but that, that brings about another problem. <coughs> People, see, when you see a certain doctor or general practitioner or say a specialist, they have your records. Yeah. People now like to doctor shop. Yeah. Well, what's your advice? I know this is not, not in what we want to talk about today, yeah. but what are your thoughts on this? We'll start with Greg. Yeah, well, I think electronic medical records is, is very important, and, and all our facilities have electronic medical records. I think that's really important because it allows us to share information because often you might see one doctor and you need to see another doctor. So the more information, more accurate information you can provide to your specialist, the, the, the more important that is. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think that's a good thing, being able to get a second opinion as well mm -hmm. um, and, and really ensuring that you get the best advice. Right. Coming back to you, Sharifa, uh, electronic uh, information, I mean, just medical records online, uh, how, um, how much have we uh, worked as a country to integrate all the facilities, especially with regards to dispensing medication, just so we know how much of... Uh, uh, what do you call it, medication we're giving out, whether it's painkillers or antibiotics. You know. yeah. Yeah. Um, interestingly, in Pharma Niagara, we, we do work together with the, um, um, the, private, the, the, the public hospitals, right. sorry, the public hospitals, mm -hmm. and uh, to develop a system, mm -hmm. a, an IT system, that tracks from the, administ uh, the patient administ administration right up to dispensing, and those are all done electronically. And even uh, it can help the uh, medical professionals in terms of ensuring uh, there's no medication error, mm -hmm. there's no drug drug interaction. So yes, that is something that is uh, very much needed uh, right now, and it is something that I foresee will grow further in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you foresee this growing further. Yeah. Now this is where coming back to what you were talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. private public collaboration yes, is very very important mm -hmm. now. Uh, where, when we start engaging uh, in New Malaysia, um, there are a couple of things we have to look at at this point. And we always take into con consideration the urban areas of Malaysia, yeah. but not take into consideration the rural areas of Malaysia. You know, yeah. How much of medicine is yeah. being dis yeah. dispensed out there and yeah. how much of information do they have? 
What are your thoughts on this? Uh, again, I think we need to use See, technology. Where you come from, Australia, is a, yeah. is a huge swath of land. And, yes. <laughs> you know, to go into the interiors, you need to fly and you've got medical Absolutely. doctors flying in. Yeah. So how do they collate information? Yeah, well, we're using technology and I think telemedicine is, is very significant in Australia. Um, and I grew up in, a, in country New South Wales. I used to drive three hours to have a game of soccer. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very, um, and we're used to the, I suppose, the sparse land that we have. It's, but as I said, technology is, is critical going forward. Telemedicine, where you can share information right. between rural outposts, because it's very difficult to get doctors to work in you know, remote areas. So I think we, we really need to use IT going forward. Well, I'd like to thank the both of you for coming in today on our first episode, our pilot, and weighing in on uh, some very interesting issues. Sharifa, thank you very much. Greg, it was a pleasure having you in the studios. Uh, we hope to have you back here again. This discussion doesn't end. Okay. Well, <laughs> stay with us. We're going to come back. We have Zulhazri uh, Razali of Pharma Nyaga joining us just after the break, right here on Medical Today, BNC. Stay with us. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today. Jared Rotnam with you. We continue our first episode with a discussion about a healthy lifestyle. Now, uh, we have Zul Hazri Razali, uh, director from Pharma Nyaga of the commercial division. He joins us today to weigh in on um, being fit. So you look pretty fit. Zul, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you're a pretty fit individual. How, how much do you exercise on a daily basis? Well, uh, I cycle almost every other day, mm -hmm. and I do more or less about 150 kilometers per week yep. on my bike. Yeah, but <laughs> see, the, the problem is not many of us do that. Now, oh, yeah. striking a balance between you know, mm -hmm. work and a healthy lifestyle mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the rest of your life, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? How do you think one can do that? Okay, basically what we normally uh, don't understand is the definition of the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay, to me, it's all about your, your capacity of your, your physical and mental uh, in order for you to, to, to do your daily thing. Mm -hmm. All right. When you talk about your work and balance lifestyle, basically you've got to be clear on the priority mm -hmm. of the day. All right. Yes, you've got to work daily or maybe some of them uh, work at night, but there must be a point where you've got to stop and you've got to shut down your body, okay, which is sleeping. Mm -hmm. So in general, you need at least six to seven hours a day. So in sleep. principle, we know this, mm -hmm. but not many of us, you know, after work, mm -hmm. uh, all of us have this thing in our minds that, okay, I'm going to go back, mm -hmm. get my bike and ride, I'm going to go to the gym. Yeah. But when you get home, as soon as you hit the couch, mm -hmm. all yeah, that goes. It's, it's, it's typical. So it, it is a discipline. Yes. In the end. Yes. Yeah. So how do you make it a discipline in your life, working for a pharmaceutical company? Okay. To me, it's all about the culture and your understanding about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, it's not easy to tell uh, the, 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 what we call the, the, the elderly population or even the younger population to, to, to exercise, right? to give some time mm -hmm. to, to, to do some physical thing. But then again, you must start somewhere. Right. All right? To me, you've got to start right from at home. Okay? Then you look at the society. Mm -hmm. If you live in an area where you hardly see people jogging or exercising, so more or less, I think you, you won't do that. Right. Let's take this further field and talk about mm -hmm. your work environment. You've yep. got people who work under you. You've yep. got a division that mm -hmm. you handle. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, help or talk to them or motivate them mm -hmm. with regards to leading a healthy lifestyle? Because you, you want your people to come yeah, in every day and exactly. not get sick leave. Okay. Basically, we are in the pharmaceutical division. Uh, we do sell drugs, and these drugs are basically to treat people which is in uh, is, uh, is some sort of like a sickness or something. But then again, when I told my people, well, apart from that, we also have to educate people of the healthy lifestyle so that there will be minimized of them or minimum number of them going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, having said that, we still have to, what we call, 
tell our, uh, our downlineness or our, our subordinates the best way of getting your work balanced with your free time. Right. Okay? Yes, there are some targets need to be met daily, weekly or monthly, but then again, we should prioritize your time so they get certain time spent on your mm -hmm. uh, own body. Okay, now, now that, 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 that's easier done than this, yes. saying you go home mm. and you want to keep work at work. They say yes. keep work at work, mm -hmm. come back home, you're home. But a lot of people go back and they and think about no, what, what happened at work today. Yeah. You know, we, we had Inche Zun who told me something today and yeah. I know I was pretty upset and I go back and think about it, it ruminates mm. in your head. Mm. Mm. Now, how do you, how do you uh, separate that part of your life? You know? mm -hmm. um, how do you do that as someone who's got a huge responsibility in the commercial division? Okay. Well, uh, some people, they learn from the past. Okay. Some people learn from their parents. All right? For example, like me, I've got my parents, both are diabetics. Mm -hmm. One passed away because of a severe diabetes condition. So I will tell myself, look, I won't be having this thing if I change my lifestyle. Right. Okay? For example, if you are prone to get diabetes because of your hereditary, mm -hmm. right? Because one of the common cause of diabetes is you get it from your parents, parents grandparents. Yeah. But you can... I slow that okay, down. Okay, so yeah. what, that's what I'm trying to say. Mm. You can slow down, okay, by changing your lifestyle so that if you hit the diabetic level, it could be sometime maybe you are 80 years old right. or maybe more than 93 years See, old. But, but that's what I'm getting at. You yeah. can be, you can be uh, disciplined. You, mm. can, you can go back and mm. work out and exercise, mm -hmm. eat a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. But if you're not stress-free, if you're not relaxed like you are, you mm -hmm. know, when you walked in here on a Saturday, mm -hmm. I could tell mm -hmm. just in the sitting room that you're in your Saturday mode. You're not yeah, like this in yeah, the office. Yeah. You know? uh -huh, uh -huh. You're just totally relaxed yeah, and uh -huh. you forget about the rest of the world. Yes. Now, that's something which is also some consider to be an art form. It's very hard oh, yeah, yes. for urban people to do yes, that. Yes, what are your yes. thoughts on this? Well, again, it's all about your, your discipline and what you want to do in life. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people feel that I've got to work hard, all right? I've got to earn some money. But then again, that's not all of it, okay? So it's quite complex in terms of every individual have to do this way or that way in terms of managing your work and your lifestyle. Okay, okay? we make it easier. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm in taking responsibility mm -hmm. for creating your own healthy life. If okay. you had to put a do and don't okay. list. Yeah. Basically, there are only two for me. Mm -hmm. All right, because... I thought it'd be a longer list. No, nah, <laughs> actually, sometimes people don't, don't, don't remember that when you want to get things uh, as simple as possible, you've got to really look at the basic. We are what we eat. Mm -hmm. All right, you can, it's no doubt about it. So the most common disease in Malaysia is all about what we eat, right. apart uh, from So th this comes other from, goes back to research done on non-communicable yes. diseases. Yes, then you've right. got to look at what you eat, what sort of risk that you are talking about when you go to a certain area to eat, or, or what you put in, in, your, in your kitchen. Secondly, most people forget is to check your health status. All right, a lot of people forget about that. Forget about that. Okay, they keep on working, working, but they forget about the time to check their health status. So when when, when you talk about saying, okay, let's let's uh, mm -hmm. uh, go back to the basics and talk about you checking your health status. Okay. How do you do that? Well, surprisingly, I go to Sam Davi every year. Mm -hmm. Right in Subang. What a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. a coincidence. My name is there for the last 10 uh -huh. years. <laughs> See, this is not in the script. I'm telling you, it's not in the script. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, I'll yeah. do a health check. Fully mm -hmm. executive health check Great in must be out there Sang Davi Subang. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. You've got to identify the issue right from the beginning. All right? So, on that manner, you've got to do health check every single year mm -hmm. or at least six months for high-risk uh, population. Right. So I'm 51. 
So I got to do it every year. Mm -hmm. If you're not six months. Hang on, you're 51. This said 25. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm 51 yeah. this year. You're 51, anyway, yeah. So that health check mm -hmm. is very critical for you to identify the issues right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of major diseases in Malaysia, it cannot be uh, what we call uh, managed because the, they have gone to advanced stages. Right. Even like diabetes, hypertension. Would you agree there was a study done, and of course I'm going to spring this on you, mm. uh, you were not told about this. There was a study done in certain parts of Malaysia, especially mm. in the kampongs. Mm -hmm. And they talked about something very interesting. They talked about you know, how the Malay culture is, the Malay uh, Islamic culture is. And when people go to sleep at night, mm -hmm. they say, okay, whatever happened today is done. I'm mm -hmm. going to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to wake up tomorrow mm -hmm. with a brand new day. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you think there's any truth in this? Yes. Uh, that comes to your, 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 your spiritual thing mm -hmm. and the way you believe in things. But uh, to me, uh, you've got to really uh, follow the way you think it is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, you can ignore the past or the previous day, mm -hmm. but moving forward, you've got to learn what you have done right before and what you can do better mm -hmm. the next day. You have to assess your day. Yeah. Put it in front of you. Exactly. Look at it and go to sleep. Yeah. For yeah. me, like example, if I miss my cycling, tomorrow definitely I'm going to put some hours on that. Mm -hmm. so, so it's so like a routine thing. Mm -hmm. When it becomes behavior, regularly, it becomes culture. Right. So when it comes to culture, then much easier to mm -hmm. lead your healthy lifestyle. So in a way, he's telling us on national TV <laughs> that he's missed his cycling today to be with us. He's going to be cycling tomorrow. <laughs> Jezul, thank you very much right, for joining us. It's a pleasure All and right. an honor. Stay with us. We're going to take another break and come back with more for you right here on Medical Today, only on BNC. Hello and welcome back to Medical Today right here on BNC. I'm Jared Rutnam. And in our final segment, we have a video for you which talks about uh, the C word. Uh, when uh, cancer is a word that triggers many emotions in adults, a lot of people go out reading about it, a lot of people dread it when someone in the family has cancer. So we decided to bring you a segment talking about it. Now we have a recording of Dr. Raja Varman and Professor Dr. Ling Hai Ping consultant pediatrician and pediatric hematologist to discuss pediatric cancer today. Let's take a look at this video. Uh, welcome to Medical Today, Professor Lin. I'm glad to meet you here today. So shall we start with our first question? You've been practicing for 40 years now. What drives this passion in you, Professor? I've been looking after children with childhood cancer for a very long time. Okay. Mainly because of one fact. And that is childhood cancer is mostly curable. And that gives me the opportunity to help children fight their cancer and help them to be cured of their cancer. That is the main reason behind my passion. That's nice of you. All right, Professor, according to statistics, pediatric cancers are not so widespread. But what are the significant changes in the statistics in the near future? Well, I must start saying uh, childhood cancer is a rare disease. It's not common at all. Okay. We see about maybe three to four new cases every day. That's counted as rare. It's not common. And there has been no increase in incidence over the past decades. It's about the same rate, the same rate. But because our population has increased, so I think we are seeing more cases in that sense. But in terms of the rate, it's about the same. Three to four new cases every, every day. And uh, of this, the majority, for about 40%, are leukemia. The leukemia is the most common. The other, the balance is due to solid tumours. Leukemia means uh, AL, as you said earlier. Leukemia is blood cancer, yes, and uh, the majority, three quarters of the blood cancers in children is 
due to acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL for short. So the other quarter is due to acute myeloid leukemia or AML. What are the uh, preventive measures or sign to look out for parents to avoid cancer in the first place? The cause of childhood cancer is unknown. It is not hereditary. Okay. There's no known cause, so you can't prevent it. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't matter very much because uh, the important thing is if the patient should get childhood cancer, it should be, he should be cured because now childhood cancer is mostly curable. So the important thing is for the parents to be aware to be aware that childhood cancer is curable and if they are aware then they will take all the steps to come as early as possible and of course uh, uh, early treatment would increase the chance of cure better results you that's see. right yeah, so results. awareness awareness yes professor if a child has been diagnosed with pediatric cancer what will be your first impression advice to the parents my, my advice to parents is uh, uh, seek early treatment at the right place and uh, when you go to the correct specialist, I'm quite sure they will uh, give you the correct treatment and treatment consists of three main parts. One is, is multimodal treatment and the dominant role is chemotherapy. Uh, in children, especially for leukemia. Leukemia can be almost exclusively be cured with just chemotherapy alone. And then uh, surgery. Surgery has a big part to play in the cure of patients with solid tumors. Brain tumor, bone cancers, kidney cancers, <coughs> solid tumors. Uh, radiotherapy also has a role, but its role is diminishing in children. Unlike adults, adults in adults, uh, radiotherapy is very important, but in children, there's less need, less and less need now for radiotherapy, which is good for children because children don't tolerate the side effects of radiotherapy are much higher in children compared to adults. adults. So, the first line treatment for children will be chemotherapy. Well, it so depends on the type of cancer. If it's leukemia, it's chemotherapy. If it's solid tumors, uh, either surgery or chemotherapy. So the method or the line of treatment depends on the severity and the type of cancer? It depends mainly on the type of cancer. Professor, to add on further, what are the methods or recommendation treatments will you perform on a pediatric cancer patients? Uh, or the first line or the method of treatment for pediatric cancer patients according to your 48 years of uh, experience? Well, as I mentioned just now, over the past 30-40 years, there has been very rapid advances in the treatment of childhood cancer. And uh, I already alluded to the role of chemotherapy, surgery and radiotherapy. And uh, a lot of uh, benefit has been given to patients now to the extent that uh, most forms of childhood cancer are now curable. Professor, how are scientists and doctors worldwide researching to the change the treatment method and finding a cure? Or are there any research or papers being published? Well, there has been a lot of changes, uh, a lot of advances in the treatment of childhood cancer. Uh, as I mentioned just now, uh, the three modalities but uh, cure is not 100% cure, right? You, you appreciate that the minority of patients are still not cured. And what cannot be cured with uh, multimodal treatment, we can cure with bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is uh, the advances relate to uh, refinement, refinement in the treatment. For example, for chemotherapy, uh, research has been directed to identify patients who need less chemotherapy, uh, therefore less toxicity, but still curable. 
In other words, we achieve the same cure rate with less chemotherapy, but you must identify which patients need less chemotherapy, less treatment, but same uh, cure rate. You can't compromise on the cure rate. The cure rate the same, but less chemo. So research is directed in that direction because uh, we are not satisfied with just cure. We want cure with less toxicity, both short-term and long-term toxicity. And what cannot be cured with multimodal treatment, we can now cure with bone marrow transplant. All right. So can you talk about your first bone marrow transplant in Malaysia? Your experience, you know, how, when you started doing bone marrow transplant? Well, the first, the first bone marrow transplant in this country was done in, on the 10th of March, 1987. That's more than 31 years ago. It was done on a child with relapse ALL, and this patient was lucky enough to have a matched sibling donor. So the, the, uh, the transplant was done, and that patient was actually the first, the first in a series of 10 patients in a pilot study initiated by the University of Malaya Medical Center. And that pilot project was important. It was initiated because uh, at that time in the 80s, uh, bone marrow transplant was still regarded as, uh, as still regarded as untested and even considered a dangerous procedure. So the question posed was, could we do, a developing country, could we do transplant in this country? And if so, is it very expensive? So the pilot project, we monitored every item in the course, even the salaries of doctors and all the staff. There was an accountant in the, in the committee to monitor all the costs. And uh, we have done the 10 transplants successfully. Uh, eight out of 10 were cured. Uh, two patients died of complications of transplant, which couldn't be avoided, but uh, to save eight lives out of ten in the pilot project, I think that was considered successful. Very but, but more importantly, uh, the cost of transplant, we, uh, as I mentioned just now, we monitored every every cent, every item of uh, uh, facility that we use was costed into the total cost. And ten patients, we spent five hundred to six hundred thousand ringgit. That works out to fifty to sixty thousand ringgit uh, per patient. Yeah. That was uh, nineteen eighty-seven. Now, compare that with if the patient were to go overseas for transplant, it will be five to six times that amount. So, this project has achieved uh, number one. Uh, it was a breakthrough for financially disadvantaged patients who would otherwise not be able to afford treatment overseas. Number two, it has paved the way to the setting up of now at least 12 transplant centres in Malaysia. Mal University of Malaysia is not the only centre. It was the only centre for six and a half years. Then more and more centres are set up, so now there are 12 centres. And also now that pilot project has paved the way to, at the moment, up to, in, uh, we have statistics to show, we have figures to show in 2015, 3,568 transplants have been done in Malaysia. So from that pilot project led to now uh, 3,005. And uh, bone marrow transplant now is the standard of care in hematology in this country. That, so that's why the pilot project done by University of Malaya is very important. So I think it has paved the way to lots of things. And we have done from bone marrow transplant, we have now done uh, peripheral blood stem cell transplant, cord blood transplants, uh, even match unrelated donor transplants, those without donors. We have uh, used donors from overseas. And uh, also, even now, for those with no donors, we are do haploidentical. We use parents as donors. We have, paid, we have opened the way now, 40 years down the line. Professor, is the government 
providing enough support for this cause in Malaysia? Well, I think uh, the government has done quite a bit because uh, over the past many years, they have set up regional centres. In the old days, when I first came back from overseas, um, cancer for children with uh, childhood cancer treatment was concentrated in Kuala Lumpur. Two centres, University of Malaya Medical Centre mainly, and also Hospital Kuala Lumpur, Institute of Pediatric. And then later on, uh, UKM, it's all Kuala Lumpur. But now we have centres in Ipoh, Penang, Johor Bahru, and even in Kota Bahru, every and state, Sabah, Sarawak. Well, the government is trying to do that now. Beginning, it's trying to uh, sort of uh, decentralise the treatment of childhood cancer. Um, well, the government has done, I must commend the government for doing all this, but there's still a lot of room for improvement in terms of facilities, in terms of financial support, because uh, I haven't mentioned about the role of bone marrow transplant. Uh, ours, ever since we've done a pilot study, uh, our pilot study has uh, paved the way to the setting up of now more than 12 centres. Originally, it was only University of Malaya, the Two only centres, only one centre for six centre. years. For six and a half years, University of Malaya was the only transplant centre for children, for children only. And now, it has gone on to, uh, now we have 12 centres throughout the country. And also, uh, even private centres, like Subang Jaya Medical Centre, we have private pediatric as well as adult. So it has expanded and also, um, uh, so in other words, transplant, the role of trans, tra bone marrow transplant is now is the standard of care now, mainly for patients who have relapsed, but also patients who have not relapsed with high risk leukemias, we do uh, bone marrow transplant. So what we can't cure with chemotherapy, we can cure with transplant. So that's the second tier, so to speak. So transplant has a role, it's a standard of care now for treatment of childhood cancer. Mm. So you, Professor, you find that we should increase more centres and more... Well, the government can do more, but uh, as, as more and more research is done, uh, it's also more and more expensive. Because once you have more things yeah. coming in, we know therapy, is more expensive and then no government in the world can support all the new things that come out because they are very expensive and, uh, and in that sense NGOs are now coming in. We have very good NGOs. Malaysians, the Malaysian public is actually, I must comment, the Malaysian public is very generous. They're very generous. When you appeal to the public for help, they always come up with a lot of money. And I think uh, the government now should coordinate the efforts with the NGOs. And, and what, not just in treatment of cancer, but also in, in the area of bone marrow transplant. Which means the government and the NGOs And the private sector, they should the collaborate, sector. yes. Yeah, I think there's, there's a big a future. Solution. There's a very good future. I mean, I must commend the government for doing their part, they can do what they can, but I think it's so expensive, they can't, no government in the world can afford the, the, this expensive treatment, no, no government, not even America. And America, the, the, the private healthcare is so expensive, without, without medical insurance, nobody can afford it. And in even the UK, the, the NHS, they are finding it very difficult. Here, we don't have, uh, uh, medical insurance, most of them, except private centers, a small percent, but uh, the, 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 med the financially disadvantaged patients, they have to rely on the government and the government can provide the basic, the basic, uh, basic the facilities, the basic uh, financial support, but if you ask for those up-to-date facilities, patients will have to raise their own money. That's where the NGOs come in. And the NGOs are, I must comment, the NGOs are excellent. I think we, we are very lucky. Our Malaysian <laughs> public very generous, really. It's so nice of you to say that. Yeah, yeah, really. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying. 
It's really true. The Malaysian public is very generous. Uh, welcome to Medical Today, Professor Lin. I'm glad to meet you here today. Thank you very much for that video. That was Dr. Varman speaking to Professor Dr. Lin Hai Ping with regards to cancer or pediatric cancer, better known as cancer that affects those under the age of 18. And it's not a very common uh, disease in Malaysia, and it is, and, and also in the world. But the majority of children with the condition can be treated, they say, and will make a full recovery. Now, very interestingly, uh, within that segment, they talked about uh, public-private cooperation. Uh, Dr. Lin talked about that. He talked about uh, NGOs and the great work they've do they're doing. And he said no government can support a medical infrastructure all the way simply because the ch of the changes, the rapid change, and the uh, equipment, and also the, the technology that comes into play all the time. So he believes that NGOs play a vital role in helping the ecosystem within a certain country, which is uh, basically what's going to happen at this point in Malaysia Bahru or New Malaysia. We're going to be seeing a lot of public-private partnerships and uh, these things are going to push the medical fraternity or the medical industry forward. Now, we also talked about uh, Dr. Google, a little something that everyone's doing every time you have a sore throat, a cold, or even a bump on your head, you go Google it. Some of us try to uh, diagnose ourselves and go get the medication from the pharmacy. So we had two experts talking about it. One uh, is uh, Sharifa Fauzia from Pharma Niaga, and the other was Greg Brown, the group chief executive officer of uh, Ramsey Syme Darby Healthcare in Rian Brown. They joined us earlier today to talk about that. Then later on, we spoke about uh, just generally being healthy and what it takes to have that discipline in working, going home and making sure you do that bit for yourself to keep yourself healthy. And we spoke to Zulhazri Razali, uh, the director for the commercial division within Pharma Niaga. He weighed in on this and he said that uh, it always comes down to you uh, keeping that in focus at all times. You know, we tend to forget this. We go back home, we sit on our couch and everything else is gone. So. Uh, once your, your day is over at work, you need to not sit down, go get that part of your work done, which is your health, and then continue with your rest of your day. So that's the advice we had uh, on the show today, our first episode of Medical Day right here on BNC. We'd like to thank you for joining us. Don't forget to join us every Saturday at 12 p.m. right here on BNC to uh, get information and also discussions and conversations from uh, doctors who will be coming in to join us right here on this show to, uh, of course, share with you their wealth of knowledge. On that note, I'm Jared Rutnam signing off. You have a great day ahead. This has been Medical Today on BNC.